Yeah. Woo. <laughs> there, he is. there he is. And the myth, the legend. <laughs> we meet again, Mr. Kemp. How are you, sir? What's up, Chris? How you doing? <laughs> well, <laughs> in uh, Chris's position here tonight, Kip is our good oh, friend. Eric. Yeah. Right. Hey, wait a minute. Why didn't you guys play the new song? Uh, because that's what Chris Chris told me to play. So you know that's what <laughs> that's how Chris rolls. He's going to tell me what to do and then have it all wrong. I'll tell you what I wanted to hear was uh, hey, Eric. Uh, wait, where's your guitar, dude? My, I got lots of guitars around, dude. Oh, where's you your guitar? guitar? You should be playing that thing while you're on here, Darren. <laughs> I got a picture of me playing, I think, Janie Lane's guitar, and I'm sitting in a room with you, and this dates back probably 18 years now. This was for the, the VH1 stripped tour where you, Stephen Piercy, Don Dawkin, the whole firehouse band. Hey, yeah, and then of course, how can we forget the guy who terrorized us the whole time? Uh, our deceased buddy, uh, Janie Lane. <laughs> what a nutty! Do you remember any of that, or did you block it out? Oh no, hell yeah, I totally remember. That was uh, how could I forget? That was <laughs> that was. I think he was at one of his lowest points. Unfortunately, poor guy. It got progressively worse as the tour went on. I mean, for me, they I almost had only threw him off the bus. Well, he got thrown off the bus. I remember we had a secondary vehicle that all the uh, road crew was on. And I think it took about three days before all of a sudden he was on that. He had pretty much run through and terrorized. I mean, he started out really nice. I remember he was at first he had a really nice, uh, I think, Taylor acoustic guitar. And I had a really shitty guitar. I was not like ready to play excuse me i was not ready to play this thing we had just got off the wasp tour i was more a rock band guy i didn't even i think own an acoustic at the time and i had to scrunch one up for this thing and i got some epiphone crappy acoustic that could hardly stay in tune and janey had this like super sweet taylor guitar and he was like hey you can play my guitar if you want and he was very friendly at first and i think he might have been sober when he first got on this thing yeah. but he fell off the wagon real quick. And then he just one by one, just terrorized every one of us. I think he also might've robbed our friend Don Dawkins of some very expensive booze one night. There was a, there was some crazy antics, but they threw him off the bus and he ended up having to follow us. And it just, it just got worse from there. But what, what a spinal tappy weird thing. Was that the first time you were ever on a tour like that, where you were on the same bus as these other. Yes. Yes. The, uh, the first and the last. <laughs> I don't no, think I, I, look I had fun on that I mean we, we had we did some fun shit on that tour and there were some there were some decent shows and stuff but yeah he was he was causing a lot of problems <laughs> you are a consummate professional though I would say at the time I mean you and Don were fantastic as well as Firehouse you know it wasn't really you know acoustic shows weren't really Piercy's wheelhouse you know he does better with the full rock band behind them and this was a weird thing for us to go up there and not have drums but you seemed very comfortable you had i would assume had been doing acoustic performances leading up to that because you would do songs like miles away and it was like it would elicit you know emotion from everyone it was just very passionate and oh, it was amazing to see to behold and this was actually like right before uh youtube uh, this is like 2006, so YouTube, there isn't much video of this out there, but I remember you being professional the whole time and killing it, but then you had the rest of us that were a mess. <laughs> Janie Piercy and uh, me and Frankie out there. I actually started my acoustic thing in 1996 because during the grunge era, it was the only gig I could get. And so yeah. I would go out. When I, put, when I did my first solo album, this conversation seems like a dream. I went out and did about 40 border books to border bookstores and and it was like 4 p.m in the afternoon and there'd be like 10 people in the in in the bookstore and i was that was like the only gig i could get at the time and so i was like one of the first guys that just wielded my acoustic and said well you know it was a it was a huge fall from grace and i just started there one by one just kind of did it. I still do my acoustic show to this day. I mean, I'm, I'm, I quite, I, I enjoy it a lot, actually. Um, 
especially when I have my percussionist with me. It's um, God, now it's it's been years and years now. But anyway, so yeah, it's fun. some kind of groove underneath, or possibly some people use backing tracks. But when I I know what you're talking about, it was a a rough ride, like the early 2000s, things were not good. And then after the station fire and the DC sniper, it was tough, man, for the for the 80s rock bands. But, uh, you know, great bands die hard and, and the fans, rock fans are, are so loyal and they did come back around like we can't live without these guys. You know, next thing you know, all our bands are back out playing festivals again. And absolutely. Yeah, no, we're doing great now. I mean, so it's been really good. Yes. Now, how about the, the, how did you survive the pandemic? Tell us about that. I mean, for musicians, it did, I don't think it was much different, right? I mean, we couldn't do as much and the streets were empty. It's like, uh, so, you know, I live in Nashville and I live downtown. So it was like weird to see like n just completely empty and because it's usually just slamming down there. But I mean, I always, I work from home anyway. So, you know, for me, it wasn't, wasn't, it was, it wasn't really that different. Okay, it was different, but not like it did didn't did, didn't destroy my life like it did a lot no. of people. I mean, I think it really screwed the world up in a bad way. But and travel became awful. Uh, <laughs> I remember when wearing a mask on a plane was like, oh, are you kidding me? I don't want to wear a mask. On the plane. Right. And then it just became second nature. But. Um, like I say, I work at home. So, I mean, I, we, we started this album, this new album in right before the pandemic and then the pandemic hit. And so it was like it set us back quite a bit. But um, when I could finally get Reb to come to Nashville, even during the pandemic, we, you know, we wrote our we wrote through it, as did most bands. I think, you know, that's why you're seeing a lot of new albums coming out now. What's yeah, it like recording in Nashville as opposed to like back in the heyday? Does that sound pretty cool or what? Recording well, in Nashville, yeah. So, well, I do everything in my own studio. Like I've had my own studio since 1996. So I learned real quick that I didn't want to pay the bills of everybody else's studio. And I also, <laughs> I'm also quite the gear. And he's gone. Did we lose Kip there? We did. We did lose Kip. Uh-oh. So, well, uh, hopefully, we Kip, if you're back. listening, you can call back and we'll pop him back in as soon as he does. I was just getting into that. I was like, go on, Kip. <laughs> hey, he's dreamy. He's good looking, man. Right, I'm lo back. getting you lost in your eyes, Kip. Go on. <laughs> what happened? Oh, there he is. He's I was back. right mid-sentence. I've been buying and selling <laughs> gear for 20 years, you know, more than that. And. I've got very nice recording gear. I don't have a lot of it because I bought and sold myself right down to the bare essentials for what I think are good. Sure. Um, and uh, so to answer your question, um, uh, there's a lot of fantastic studios in Nashville, like the top drawer stuff, all levels, the very highest ones you can get next to Abbey Road all the way down to – you know, junior's backyard. And, you know, and there, the thing about Nashville is that it's, you know, big country town and the, and people write songs nonstop. And so they're cranking out 250 demos a day or whatever, you know, it's insane. It's insane. Um, having said that, a lot of it sounds quite cookie cutter. Some of it's incredible, mm -hmm. but, um, but to answer your question, I mean, it's, for me, it's no different than working anywhere else I have because it's all in my own space, you know. So, um, right. You have time to really explore, too, right, Kip? I mean, some of these tracks on this new album, which, by the way, the album is called Seven, and the release date is going to be May 5th. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There, there's some kick ass songs for the old Winger fans. Plus, the, you know, you guys have grown as songwriters as well. But uh, I'll tell you the last track on there stuck with me. And this is like an opus that you have. This, this song's like seven minutes long, but yeah, all comes back around and it, it's a beautifully complex song where it's almost like you were, you wanted to get the respect of these Nashville <laughs> you know, people there. You, you went the extra distance with this track. So I wanted oh, to commend you. you. That, that's actually my favorite song on the record. It's totally, it's, it's kind of like headed for a heartbreak number two, mm -hmm. but I didn't intentionally do that. It was kind of by accident. I, um, 
and actually, you know, I, I wrote that song myself. I wrote Headed for Heartbreak myself, too, but um, it it wasn't unintentional. It was like a, you know, I had I had the keyboard riff and, and Reb, you know, Reb would come and go and I would keep working on stuff as we were writing. And I just fell upon that idea by accident. And I I say this in every interview I do. All great ideas happen by accident. You can't try to craft a great idea. It's always like crafting stuff and fumbling through the darkness and then bang, you get hit by lightning by accident because your coffee spilled on your keyboard and you went to wipe it and hit exactly the right note that you were looking for or something right. like that. But, um, and that's how that song was born. And, and um, it's got kind of an orchestral middle eight and then a big long ending for the solo. Uh, Cause traditionally on winger albums, we do a long ending on, on our on one song so reb can just do what he does you know and, sure uh, now you're you're a rock guy you've always been and the influences are there too i mean there's a little bit of uh acdc on some of the tracks a little bit of kiss uh sound sauce and and actually you know i don't know if you would agree with this or not but uh, one of my favorite bands rainbow oh, uh, yeah. there's there's a song, you know, stick the knife in and twist. To me, uh, it has kind of a Death Alley Driver kind of vibe. It does. Which I love that track. It does. Okay, I, I don't yeah. know if that was intentional or not. No, it wasn't, but you're right. I mean, I wouldn't have thought of that, but it, but it definitely does. I couldn't remember. It's kind of, especially when you get to the verse, it's like, yeah, totally. Well, in rock music, you know, there's a lot of uh, songs that, are similar to others. There's only seven notes. You know what I mean? You're going to, some of these prog rock progressions uh, are similar or can work over other ones and so forth. But uh, right. I thought the record, I was very impressed with it. I mean, the consistency of it. And I definitely uh, highly recommend all, all eighties rock people pick this up and especially the winger fans are going to love it for sure. And like you said, um, you know, you have some old school songs, uh, broken glass is another vibey track tell Broken us a little glass, bit about that one it's a very interesting song you know relationship song the um the the interesting part of that song is that paul taylor and and by the way it's all original members on this on this album and every guy played on every song so the recipe of the band is all in every track but on on broken glass paul taylor actually played the guitar solo and, wow, which is which is something that he's never done on a winger album before, and he's a great lead player. So I was, I was thinking, well, let's get Paula on here to to play a solo, and he did an awesome job. And uh, that one was one of the first songs we we wrote mu for musically. We we had the chorus, we were, you know, kind of pounding out the chorus, and Reb, I think wrote the chorus melody in octaves on his guitar, and I just kind of started singing along with it. And then Reb went home and then, you know, it's always kind of like Reb and I start something. He'll, we'll do a riff, we'll arrange the stuff. And then I'm always left to finish a lot of the stuff. But um, do you guys do it together or all the time? Or, or is it more like he's in his studio at home and just you bounce stuff back and forth to each other? No, I, I refuse to do that. I can't work like that. I think, you know, the only time I work like that is, for example, when I did a, a she said, she said thing for COVID with Mike Portnoy and Andy Timmons and, and Jeff Scott Soto, you know, where we're all phoning in our tracks and stuff. But when it comes mm -hmm. to something so high stakes, I mean, I and I've just very, I've got a definite way I want to hear stuff. So I want to be able to sit with the, the, the musician, not tell them what to do, but Rev and I have a kind of a simpatico that way. He knows, and tr we trust each other, and that's really key. You know, he'll be playing, I'll be like, fix that one thing right there. And I don't want to have to do that, but you can't really do that long distance. I mean, it's all sure. like very visceral. We're in the moment. We don't make demos. If we come up with the if we come up with the the riff and the track, we cut it right there. I said before we write one note, I set up all the tones. Guitar sound, like made for the album guitar song before we write note one 
I've actually never said that in an interview. That's the first time. <laughs> now, do you model certain amps that you've you've owned, and that's how you got these tones, or yeah, how do you no, how do you no, go no. about getting the tones for this? Record? No, that's a, that's Reb's guitar going through a John Sir custom audio head through a uh, sixty six reissue Marshall slant cabinet with green bags, and the microphone is a, a Sure KSM thirty two into a Neve. Pre, uh, 1272 preamp right into Pro Tools. Wow. Yeah, we don't model anything. I don't do any of that modeling stuff. Um, right. Maybe I should. I don't. I don't look down on it. I just. I. Uh, it's not I, all the way there yet. It's. I, yeah, I. I do it for solos. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. I can hear the difference. A lot of people can't. Some people can. Um, it's great for live because you don't have to worry about what amp you're getting that night. Although we don't. We're so old school, dude. We still rent gear when we play live. It's like we're it's yeah. a gamble on which Marshall we're gonna get, you know. Uh -huh. I asked for a Marshall nine hundred and hope for the best, man. I have my uh what four boss pedals I bring and I do a four cable method and boom boom, that's it. Right. Right. Hey, hey Kip, I got a question for you. Uh, what do you think about the uh the state of rock radio anymore? I live in Cleveland, Ohio. It's supposedly the rock and roll capital of the world, and yet the rock radio sucks around here. And I, I, I don't know if it's any better across the country. I mean, rock radio needs to pick up bands like you guys again and start playing this shit. That would be awesome. But uh, I don't, man, I don't see that happening. I, I, uh, it would be great if, especially, I mean, I feel like proud Desperado is totally worthy of radio play, but um you know, stuff. I, I, I'm totally out of touch with it, so I'm not really qualified to talk about that because, you know, I got a lot to say about the things I know about and not much to say about the things I don't, uh, and that's one of them. I, I don't know what's on the radio these days. I, everybody always quotes me like, "Well, you know, you're not going to get on the radio with Five Finger Death Punch," so I guess <laughs> I guess they're on the radio. I don't know, but well, with serious radio though, I mean, you're 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 on Eddie Trunk's show and. All the '80s stuff on XM. Yeah, I, right? I just I wish mean, there was more commercial play for bands that you know are good, and I don't think it gets enough commercial play. I mean, maybe that's not what people want anymore, but I want it, and I think there's a big audience for it. And I just think the state of rock music needs to come back to what it was. Well, I, you know, I'm with you. I'm with you. You know, the problem is, is that this is also generational, and we're in this group with a with certain mentality. And there's a whole nother faction that's like listening to falling in reverse and it has nothing to do with what we do. Um, What's even weirder, Kip, that, that trips me out is when you consider how much time had gone from the big band of the 40s to like when Winger was on MTV, like how, how much of a duration of time that was, and then move that there's been that much time between the 80s and now, in a sense, that it's just oh weird God. that it. It that's did. A, that's, a, that's a bizarre realization. It is, but it's it did slow down. It's cyclical. Uh, some music cyclical, but uh, and therefore, therefore, it kind of doesn't. It's not a straight shot of transformation. But there's been a lot of time since Piercy and Winger and you, uh, you know, have uh, debuted enough time that it's similar to that musically duration wise of years. But uh, that's amazing. Yeah, it's wow. it's all been done pretty much but you know we got to see if it if it uh, if it morphs into something else i've mentioned before on, on past episodes that i see a lot of young kids starting to play guitar because of youtube what a great teacher youtube is that we never had uh growing up you either went were able to afford to go to git to learn how to shred or you didn't you know and uh, now kids are getting some amazing, you know, guitar lessons. So I am expecting a new generation of guitars, uh, guitarists to come up and uh, rock music to come back around again. Because I, I think kids are realizing that they're being ripped off, that a lot of this uh, hip hop music and so forth is just very inexpensive to produce. And that's why it's pushed on that's kids. That's really interesting that you say that, that it's that they use that, that, adjective but inexpensive that's a really interesting way to think about it i i have to think about that to, sure. give, you, to give you my answer um, well it's you know when you think back of the the 80s recordings like i i 
heard from Steven, you know, what some of the budgets were for rat going in and it was astronomical, you know, where today you can achieve so much more with your equipment in, in your studio there than what they had at the time. They literally spent probably a million dollars to make any one of those uh, records uh, back then. And that was with everything involved, probably, you know, the, 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 the producing everybody that's got a hand in it, but you've streamlined things to this point where am I wrong in saying that, that this winger album is completely self-produced? Totally. Yeah, no, but every winger album has been self-produced. I, but the early days with Atlantic, we, our budget was 125 grand. That's what we spent on our first album. The second album was, maybe 200 and the third album might have been 300 because that's the way our, our deal went. And that was because the studios back then with, with, you know, needing the technology, you had to pay, you know, anywhere between 1200 to 2000 a day or whatever. You know? mm -hmm. And so you'd be in there six months and, you know, it adds up fast. And then the producer fee and the whatever, all the crap. And then as technology, you know, has become what it is, it's like, you know, you can go, I don't know. I mean, you can do it for, uh, you could do it all in, I know a, a little, uh, uh, in, I, I know a, a friend of mine in, in Istanbul whose son does everything in, in garage band and it sounds better than anything I do. And I don't know how he does it. I mean, he programs all his own plugins and he's a, he's a little genius, but, um, so, and I have a lot of really good gear that might, if it was like a, commercial studio might cost you know i don't know a couple hundred a day i don't know what but sure yeah, i mean it's a lot cheaper and it's a lot easier to do it your, yourself the one thing i would say about all of this stuff is none of it matters if you can't connect an emotion even you know if it's r&b or if it's heavy metal or if it's just playing up straight up rock or pop or whatever it is like how it's made doesn't really mean anything it's all right. about it's all about the end result, which is the emotion of the music. Like, even if it's intellectually incredible and it doesn't make you feel anything, it's still not successful, in my opinion. Like, if the only successful music is that would that that you know can evoke a strong emotion, really, you know, like whether it's oh this makes me feel cool or oh I feel very sad when I feel I I love this song it makes me feel happy just something about how it's affecting you. And I think, you know, our generation, we, we look, we look at other music and we go, Oh, I don't get it. But I mean, people get it, you know, it's all about how you're connecting and this, the, yeah. like the R and B culture, like I can't totally relate, but, but, but I have listened to a lot of it where I'm like kind of blown away by the production, you know, it's like, and sure. I feel something from it. I'm like, Oh my God, that's so cool. How do they, how did they do that? You know, and and they all I, have really big choruses, and, and you you were uh, right think, in there on your new record with making sure that the the catchiness of your choruses were clearly important. Where you wanted to have that, I don't want to say marketability, but just to be well, like I, you said, to be able to connect with people in that sense. I'm old school songwriter. I mean, the the, the song has to go like this, and hit you when it when it when it hits you with the chorus, it, you, it's got to take off, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just following in the footsteps of those who have come before me, you know. <laughs> we but, did a great job of it. Now, you know what? What we need to talk about here, because as you can see, the ship in the background, Stephen Piercy has just been added to the Monsters of Rock cruise that oh, I know right. you're going to be on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm a little terrified of this. I've never been on a cruise in my life. So I thought you could tell me and Seth a little bit about your past experiences. Have you done the Monsters Rock Cruise before this? Yeah, many times. And I was like you at the beginning. I was like, eh, not into it. Like, sat in my cab and, you know, moping for the first couple of days. <laughs> like, eh, you know. And, and then, and it was like, you know, it was the reverse of Darth Vader. It was like, give in to your love. <laughs> you know, it was like, what's not to like? You're out on the ocean, the sun's shining, the, the, the food's great. And like, you know. Have they always hooked you up with like a, a good 
suite kind of deal or you know you're not in a bunk bed with reb right no 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 i mean we we, we all get our own rooms i mean it's it's, it's, it's do you get a little port window to like no 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 we're we know we're, we're we, you know we're we get the balconies but um, nice where you can like go out and actually sit on the balcony yeah sure yeah sure oh yeah. man that looks pretty dope i did watch like on youtube they have some monsters of rock cruise videos on there from the past years so i was yeah. trying to kind of get a feel but one thing i noticed that was like maybe feel a little uneasy now i'm not as you know anywhere near the fame of you and the other headliners on there uh but i, I saw sebastian bach and i noticed like people were going up and like you know, tapping him. He was like, he was at the bar, like trying to get a drink and just these constant like fingers of people. Hey, 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 and he was like kind of ignoring him. And I don't know, man, that's, you got to be in the right frame of mind to be around those fans. Right. Well, I mean, you just, you know, they're who put you there. So, I mean, I don't mind hanging yeah. with the fans, you know, you, you just know that if you go down into general pop, <laughs> uh, you're just going to be taking photos and hanging with the sure. people that put you there. And I don't mind it at all, actually. I'm, I'm, you keep telling yourself that. <laughs> I'm, well, no, I'm pretty well known for like the guy that hangs the most out, out, you know, out in the, what, you know, going to see other bands and doing events and stuff like that, because it's like people dig it, you know, it's fun. I, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the cruises. I, I really, I mean, I'm loyal to the monsters of rock cruise. We've done, We've been offered a bunch of other cruises, right? And I'm I'm really loyal to the Monsters of Rock cruise because it's it's really like it's a real rock cruise, you know. There's no like mm -hmm. other style music on there, and it's, uh, you know, it's kind of, you know, everybody's in the same frame of mind, and and you know, there's a lot of great other acts and stuff, and it's this just got me out I of the dog. House. I love to gamble, so I'm always oh. in the, you know on the casino. But I interrupted you. What did you say? Oh, I was going to say this cruise got me out of the doghouse with my lady that I live with because it's tough, you know, being, a, you know, dating a musician and this yeah. and, you know, we have our, our issues uh, as the, as our viewers know. Uh, but when this cruise came up and I was like, guess what? I'm taking you on a cruise, babe. This just <laughs> absolved me of like all wrongdoings. Like we have been getting along so good. She's so excited about this. Yeah, She's like, but see, that would be like the worst though, man. That would be taking your girl on a cruise where there's girls like taking sand to the beach and the bikinis <laughs> all over the place, all over the boat. I mean, that would be crazy. She I'd would, she would make it miserable for me if I, if she wasn't there, it's better that we're together on this and, and <laughs> no, no, this no, would no, go a long way. It's not a hookup scene. It's a really, right. You know, everybody's everybody's out. Every most everyone has a partner, and it's just fun. Right. You know, it's just like seeing these bands in different setting that you would norm never never normally see them in, and and the production's really high quality, and, and it's really well put together. And so, some, would you say you got to correct me if I'm wrong? Like, as far as our 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 bands go we have to play like two different concerts or something like that during the five yeah, you days do, and does two shows. Yeah. And maybe you'll do a, a photo experience event or something like that. Yeah, do, see, back do another here, play girl, another play girl. I don't know, like where, the, where everybody gets their photo with you, you know, back here I, in Cleveland, we used to have monsters of rock, like concerts here at the rubber ball right. in Akron. And tickets would be like fifteen bucks, and you get the biggest bands in the world. I mean, and, you know, listen, Cle Ohio rocks like no other state in the union. I'm, I'm telling you, every rock show I've ever done in Ohio just is is is, is like top notch fans. I mean, they just rock it, man. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I just miss concerts like that. I mean, the cruise sounds amazing, and I would love to be able to get on one of those cruises. Well, that's what but, this is, Steph. This is I know, this is but, Monsters of Rock, put on a boat. We need monsters of rock in stadiums again. Get you guys out and play in front of seventy thousand. For me, it doesn't last crazy. long enough. I would. I wish it was like ten days. You know. <laughs> well, now you're getting me excited about it. Yeah. Um. I, you know, I got to make sure I'm mentally prepared for this. But it sounds like it's going to be a great time. Now, does this? When you've done these before, it always goes to like a different location every cruise, right? Does it? it has it always gone to the? Uh, I forgot what this one even is going, like off of Haiti or something. I don't remember. Yeah, you guys, everybody has to look that up. You just go to the <laughs> because I've been on so many of them, I can't keep track. But they're different, though, right? You've gone to like different spots for it, yeah. as far as. And do you actually get off the ship too, or do you stay on there? Is that too I get sketchy? off? No, I get off. I, I 
the first time I did it, I did not get off. But every time since I get off and and uh, go to the beach and and uh, get some food or buy some weird stuff, you know, I don't know, just uh, <laughs> I really, you know, my dream life is I used to live in Florida and I loved it. You know, I like I like the Caribbean vibe. You know? Right. You got a big tour coming up, though, right? After the, the, the cruise, are you touring? Tons of gigs. Are, I mean, the whole year is filling up really fast because of this, you know, the new album. And, and it's the 35th anniversary of the first album. And it's the 30th anniversary of our third album, um, which is, a, you know, a big favorite among Winger fans. Um, this album, Pull. And, you know, the new album is kind of what I tried to do is like, inject the inspiration of the first album with with the musical intelligence of the third album so it's really kind of a mixture of those two uh albums we went back to the original logo we got all the original guys they played on every track so it's um it's it is a full circle event for us this is the most women we've ever had tuned into the show Kim. it's amazing <laughs> usually, it's usually the Chris Aiken presents show is a total sword fight. I'm going to be That's honest. A <laughs> We've had, I've been counting over here while you've been talking, and they just keep coming one after the other, one yeah. after the Here's other. Some of the comments, I, um, how do you know how many people are on here? Let's see, the comments kind of come up one at a time. Yeah, that's that's me pushing. I'm pushing. He put, he's push. highlighting the the ones that are less dirty that are okay to put. Oh, there's yeah, this is a children's show. This. I'm sorry, I came on early, Carrie. I've been on since five fifteen. Kip was excited to be on uh, the big monsters of rock. Actually, the last time I saw you was magical. It was at the Chris Angel birthday extra. Am I right? It was Chris Angel's yeah, birthday yeah, yeah, in yeah, Vegas. Yeah, Chris Angel. I mean, what a what a talk about a genuinely awesome sweetheart of a guy. I'm mean, gee whiz. He does uh, amazing things for children's hospitals, and the guy raised like a. I mean, he he raised a good amount of money, and then he just threw like an extra mill out of his pocket. Like, Unreal, man. He's really genuine. I mean, he's the real deal. Like, you know, he's uh I, I met him for the first time that night. He texts me all the time now. He's like, you know, he's just uh He loves rock, 80s yeah, stuff. No, he's he's a great dude, man. Um anyway, so that was yeah, that was a great honor to play at that thing. And there was our buddy Paul Stanley there, who I'm a huge fan of, and decided to get up and jam and I had to follow him at that concert. It was like, uh oh. <laughs> well, for me, the, the most memorable thing was Robin Zander. Oh yeah. Uh, of course. Okay. So he was super nice. That was the first time I had ever, you know, actually like met him in person. He was, he was very nice to me. Uh, and then at the end uh, he was, he was kind of the headliner, if you will. And at some point, the, the band's playing surrender and they, they bring out like all the performers that were there. I think even flavor Flav might've been, might've been yeah. in attendance there. Uh, but somehow I ended up on a microphone with you and we were like, your mama's all right. Your dad is all right. And we we're singing it together. I didn't even know that was going to happen. And I was like, I, I had to stay at pure season. He lives in Vegas. Now I don't, I live in San Diego, but I had to go stay at his house for that. We had just played a show, but instead of going home, I went to his house and they had been taking good care of me, but they didn't feed me like dinner that night. They assumed there was going to be food there and there was. And so I was like backstage eating nauseous. I don't know if I had like cheese breath or, or, or whatever bad breath when I was saying that. I, I don't I remember. I don't Okay, remember. good. Because I know I was like, I was like, surrender, <laughs> surrender. <laughs> and I was like, oh shit, I hope I'm not breathing bad breath on Kip. No, nah, no, nah, that's, that's, <laughs> it's all good, man. I've had, I've had okay. way worse. Trust me. Okay, good. Um, I feel sometimes I, I, in my acoustic show, I bring random people up to sing miles <laughs> away, and I always have a pack of gum there here you know, <laughs> before you sing. Um, that's you make them sing with a mask guys, on. A lot of guys move to move to Vegas. Um, uh, um, and I, it's I guess it's the place to go. I mean, I, I moved to Nashville in 2002 and like since then it's become like a huge place for all the people to go. And uh, it's, it's uh, San Diego. That's God's country. I mean, that's the main right. day. Right. I live in Oceanside. I, I, Kip, you would not believe like where I'm living right now. I don't even know how this happened, but I'm in like this dope condo living with this beautiful woman, like, 
right on the strand at Oceanside here. And it's insane. I'm, I don't deserve it, but I'll take it. Wow. That's good. good for you. Hey, yeah. what's the origin of your last name? Is it Greek? That is Greek. Yes. Oh, there you go. Do you speak Greek? Tikanis. Tikanis, Kip. Oh, right on, right on. <laughs> How I about Winger? It. That's German, right? Yeah, through and through. <laughs> Kip Finger, you will buy the new album and you will love it. Get out. Um, Get out. Now I have, uh, I have my my grand my 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 grandfather's my great grandfather's all immigrated to Germany from Russia, and right. uh, I'm reading the comment. Oh. She said she danced with you in the '80s in Thunderdome with Baltimore. Wow. Ooh. That's amazing. The Thunderdome. That's right. I remember that place. That was a great place. But yeah, my 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 great grandfather's are Russian immigrants to Germany. So I have some Russian in me, which is always nice because the Russian composers are really the best. But um, the Russian and the French, in my opinion, Germans, everybody, you know, uh, re references the German composers, but the Russians and the French, man. How did you how did you land on using the name for uh, your name for the band name? Did you try other names first? Like what were some alternate possible names you had? It was a uh, it was totally by accident. We were Sahara. Okay. And that was that that we couldn't be Sahara because somebody served us with a notice that they owned the name. All right. And, yeah, that uh, band's name sounds familiar to me. And so we called the first album Sahara and it's down there in the in the in the in the lower right hand side you'll see it but atlantic didn't get that they just called the album with the self-titled album by winger but we were at a time and back then it was like who could come up with a cool band name back then you know now there's right. a lot of cool band names but somehow it worked though man it's like winger i mean it's like uh like an Air Force jet or something, like a wing or uh, a jet or something. Well, that's cool that you think so because I always, totally. I, I was always, <laughs> I never wanted the name, the band of the, the band to be named after me because it was, it was a genuine band. You know, I, I uh, you know, I co-wrote all the songs with Rab, and you right. know, we were like, it was like four guys doing a band. You know. But it is Reb what got it is. us do. I mean, anybody from then knows Reb's a top shredder from the Winger days and the videos just doing phenomenal like tap. There was already tapping from Van Halen, but like Reb was one of the first guys that I remember doing multiple finger tapping on the solos. Uh, I mean, and he was really young, too. How old were you guys when the first album came out? I was I was pretty old. I was like 28. I mean, a lot of guys like Def Leppard and all those guys, they were rocking it at 19 and they, you know, and they they all got record deals at a much earlier age. I mean, I was I was uh I was up there and I uh, I uh I started in a band with my two older brothers and did my first professional gig at 8. So by the time I was 28, I'd been doing it for 20 years and I was thinking, "Geez, I wonder if I'm never going to make it, you know." Mm -hmm. but or you're not going to get in the 27 club because you know you're already I, well exactly thank well knock on wood i'm glad i'm not but, um, <laughs> you're like well shit now i gotta hang in there and yeah 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 um i want to be in the 107 club <laughs> right the older we get the older we want to be isn't that right last man standing baby <laughs> that's no, right I, well you I, look great Kip. You. you look great what, yeah, my wife thinks so by the way she has not stopped texting me throughout the entire interview about how great Kip looks. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, tell her thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do that. <laughs> the ladies are excited today on the Chris. Yeah, they are. Show. Actually, we got a text from another uh, woman who wanted to know any orchestras you'd like to work with or anything classical you got in the works. Oh, yeah. There's the New York Phil, Berlin, Philharmonic, um, L.A. Phil. I mean, that those those would be incredible. Um High goal. That's a lofty goal for somebody like myself. I, I've been very fortunate in the classical world to get quite a few super high quality performances and commissions. Um, it's been a very long road, but I've been, you know, lucky. I got that Grammy nomination and yeah. um, congrats for classical composition. Thank you. And um, so it's been 
it's been great. Um, having said that, you know, when you get a commission from a major orchestra, I'm working with Nashville Symphony right now, writing a violin concerto for them. And they premiered my first symphony last March. And they're making an album of my two pieces of my classical music on Naxos, which is actually the biggest classical label. So it's, you know, it's high stakes, man. I mean, the pressure's, the pressure's uh, pretty intense, but uh, I, and I, and when you get a commission, it's like, it, it, it can work against you because it's like, you have to live up to this thing, you know? And I, I work, best, I work best when I just want to create something because I have a very high bar internally anyway, and I'm a great self editor. Like I won't do anything. Uh, thank you, uh, Yasmin. I guess you saw Atonement was my first symphony. Thank you very much for for saying that. Um, and you did just sell another uh, record, so you know on our show we helped. Yeah, that thank happen. you for pre ordering. Yeah, we. Uh, anyway, the point is, is that the pressure, the stakes are high. I work, I work well on my own, but you know I've been lucky and and, and stuffs happening and and I, I i i managed to juggle both worlds pretty well because one kind of feeds the other you know like the the visceralness of being in a rock band and high-fiving the people in the front row and then and then taking that energy and translating into a classical piece and turning on a lot of people to classical music too that they wouldn't have um greetings from brazil hi how are you See, um, Kip knew where that was. I wouldn't even know what flag that <laughs> is. That flag, yeah. Um, yeah, one one kind of feeds the other, you know. So it's it's. Um, I've, well, it, metal metal music has a, has a lot of classical influence. Actually, I mean some some classical pieces are very metal to me. Sure, you know, I mean, I hear them. Stiff, you know, down, 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 down. Totally. It was totally taken from that. Uh, oh, he was but it is higher minded music and it, it is cool to turn your average rock people onto classical stuff for sure. A lot of people that I turned on to it, they're like, oh my God, I had never knew I could feel this. Mm -hmm. And so that's what happened to me. I was a kid and I, uh, uh, I've, I've told this story so many times. Most people that know me know this story, but I had a girlfriend that wanted to take ballet and nobody would, none of her girlfriends would take it with her. And so I was like, I'll do it. And that sounds fun, you know, cause I, I was in karate and really stretched out and I got into it and I, and I took to it. I just was like, Oh my God, this is amazing. She quit immediately. And, and I, uh, I just went on to, you know, I was in a company and I was hearing this music going, oh my God, like, wh where did this come from? You know, and that's kind of set me off on that path. But that's uh, cool. For me, it was uh, the Star Wars soundtrack in the 70s as a little kid. I'm, I'm, I'm 50, but, you know, hearing that was my like introduction to like a classical score, if you will. And well, John, a lot of yeah, I mean John Williams is is absolutely. I mean he's one of the greatest living composers. I mean beyond a shadow of a doubt. I mean the guy's just he's so heads and shoulders above so many other people. I mean incredible. But yeah. but thank you. Uh, by the way, you can pre-order our album on Amazon or uh, iTunes or wherever. So it's Kip's coming. It's going to go platinum by the time the show's over. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> That'd be great. We got a new single coming soon. Our first single was Proud Dust Broad. We got another single coming soon. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but mm -hmm. uh, well, I can tell you that we've made six videos. And so um, it's going to be, you know, we'll be releasing a lot of stuff. Shouldn't you have done seven videos? Seven would have been better. Good, yeah. Good point. <laughs> I wanted to say, I wanted to say, Eric, that that you said you mentioned there's seven notes um, in the diatonic scale, but there is twelve. Uh, one, That's two, right. three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve notes. Correct. Um, depending upon how much kookiness you're going for, but uh, <laughs> but it is it is to what to to your point about seven notes. The 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 um, the album title seven has this kind of metaphysical connotation and that's kind of why I zeroed in on it um, as kind of a full circle from where we came from and, and somehow not closing the circle, but, but definitely encapsulating the life and history of the band because it was, t it was almost 10 years since our last record. I don't know 
when we would make another one. But um, and and it might just be that right out of nowhere, I make a totally progressive record specifically to showcase the musicianship of the band because we've we've done it all in and especially in this album i mean i think every song has a small element of what we are all about i mean it really it really encapsulates the kind of story of the band you know i concur with that listening to it today i mean being familiar with your with your career especially the beginnings of it I was satisfied as a as a listener and a liker of the Winger Band from way back. I mean, I give it two thumbs up. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate. I went it. through the whole thing today. That's nice of you, Seth. Did you hear it? Absolutely, Probably. I did. I got an email. Oh, you did. Yes, I absolutely did. It's fantastic, man. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I, I, are you I, Are you recording any time with Stephen? Uh, yeah, right now, the, the most recent thing I recorded was a cover that he wanted to do. And that's going to go uh, as like an added track on a on a best of thing he has coming out, like a Stephen Piercy legacy. Mm-hmm. Uh, we will have a follow up to the uh, two records we did on Frontiers, uh, the Smash and Beauty of Thrill. And that's just something we've been working on. Obviously, we got side sidelined as well with the pandemic and he had uh, his own things going on. He had his version of rat with Juan that he did for a minute. And that kind of went by the wayside. Uh, but it's pretty much as far as I know, just, you know, Piercy solo band, we're going to be hitting it hard this year, probably doing more stuff bills that you guys are on. I'm super stoked about the monsters of rock cruise. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, but yeah, we will do, we will be doing uh, definitely more recording and we'll probably continue to do it over at Matt Thorns and Burbank. I don't know if you know, Matt, I he know. was in rough cat, rough cut. Basis. I know who he is. Of course. Yeah. I don't, I, we've never, we've never uh, palled around or anything. We've done all the records there. And, you know, to, to what you were saying, you know, earlier about being in the same room as Reb, uh, Piercy and I work the best that way too. Like we, we don't, I might come up with the rips ahead of time uh, and so forth. But when we go up there to get his vocals together, whatever we work best in the room, Matt, he, uh, Steven and myself and just backs to the wall, you know, do or die situation it ends up bringing out the best in you and things that because you're on a, a deadline, I mean, you're there to work that day and you gotta, you gotta Ooh. do this and you have these the energies of both you know at least one other person or two other people and you get you know you're putting your minds together for something greater than yourself and you just yeah. do it and yeah, exactly. the, the best things come out of it and like you said mistakes too there's beautiful mistakes that end up being your favorite parts to songs yeah it's being able to recognize those mistakes as being beautiful that, that's the key you know you got to realize when when the universe is going hey st- what about this? <laughs> That's right. You think you can don't always go your way. You gotta. You have to uh, learn to. Uh, I'm doing that right by. now. I'm overthinking the second movement of my violin concerto. I've got this, what I think is is an amazing start to it, and it's it's come to it. It it, it goes. I don't know. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, fifteen. I don't know. It's it's right here. Somebody uh, wanted to know what your inspiration is for the uh, violin. My, I think for the LA, oh yeah, violin concerto. There you go. I'll tell you one second. Um, it's it's several bars, and I can't. I'm completely stumped. I'm like I can't go past it. I mean, when I, by the way, when I write, and I've got my little keyboard right here. I'm I'm I don't I'm not at home right now. I live in Nashville, but right now I'm in California. Right. But um, I uh, I, I can't sit at the instrument much anymore. I have to get away from it. Like I'll sit down and play a couple notes and then it, I find it very distracting to hear the sound of an instrument. So I walk away more than I do work on an instrument and just try to listen to what I'm hearing, you know? And uh, it's, it's uh, I'm really having a tough time right now. I mean, do you really, have a deadline for this? Uh I, 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 my deadline is self-imposed. It's it, it's got to be done by the end of the year, but it's going to be hopefully performed next year. So it needs to be done by then anyway, you know, because you have to you have to hand it in months before so the violinist can learn it. Is this the last piece of the of this 
concerto that you have the violin part? It is. It is. I, I finish, but I, I need to reorchestrate some stuff and get it completely happening. You know, each piece, you know, you're climbing up the ladder trying to make it better than the last thing you did. I made some mistakes on my symphony that were like, I can't believe that I made those mistakes after having already written so many other pieces before, but it's just the way it's the nature of the beast. You, you got 80 players on stage and it's like, right. You know, where does the violin sit for that? Would you, would you, is that like the, the lead vocal of, of the instruments in a sense? Yeah, I, I, any, concerto? any, any concerto is, is if it's a piano concerto, the piano is the lead voice. If it's a cello, I mean, it would be the cello. Right. So it's really, and I found, I was very intimidated by the idea at first. And then I realized that I've been working on solos with Reb Beats for 20 years. So I just was like, well, I'm going to think about it like that because the violin can just go, yeah. you know, the, and kind of do this kind of a thing uh, while making it, trying to make it, you know, very. You know, the range you know, of the violin is great for sure. It is. Surprisingly, it's not actually that wide of a range it's, the first note is a g below middle c that's the lowest note they can hit um but fantastic instrument a lot to learn there i've been a, doing a deep dive into i'm surprised having written so much music that i didn't know so much about that instrument and you you don't actually play you do it on a keyboard you have to write it to write it you're using your keyboard basically mostly just my mind and then I'll try to fumble out on the keyboard about to do and then I'll program in 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 a sequence or a lot of the stuff because I can't play it that fast so I'll just most you know I'm trying to get to the point where I can just more more like think it and and do it because like I say the instrument it it's very very distracting you know because you'll play a thing and oh that sounds so good let me write that and you go off on a tangent it's like it, too, you, busy? It, it yeah, too busy. It too busy. Well, you, you just get distracted by the sound of the of the of the instrument itself, and and you and you forget about the structure and where it needs to be melodically and this kind of thing. Fascinating. Yeah, it's higher minded, mate. I have to say. It is. <laughs> well, I, 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 never, I listen to so much music, and I, I you don't think about half this stuff. It's truly really amazing the kind of mind you got to have. Not an entire concerto. I mean, I've done little bridge sections that were a little orchestrated, if you will, but nothing. Yeah, well, I mean, look, I don't look. You know what? I I don't. I certainly hope I don't sound like I'm bragging or anything. It's I no. wouldn't I, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend it for anybody who could sit. I only recommend it if you can't live without it. <laughs> you know, does that well, make sense? Yeah, like. I, you, I, I, I love what you're doing. And, and, you know, as I, as I said before, that uh, all comes back around was very cinematic also and, and almost had a little bit of orchestration going Compositionally, on. I put as much into that as I would into, a, into, into what I'm doing in classical. Well, it was not lost on me, sir. I want well, I you to appreciate know. You I that. really loved it. Yeah. Uh, and to me, I mean, I think it's, you know, for direct movie directors out there, you know, this is a song that could be in like a new Batman movie or I, I don't know, some, some big movie or something. I don't know. It had a cine, uh, cinematographic, uh, thank you for saying, it. I appreciate that. If you know any producers that are doing that, <laughs> <laughs> Scorsese, if you're listening, does he do Batman? No, who's like, no. Uh, <laughs> I, don't no, I don't think he does bad. No, <laughs> he does the Godfather Batman. <laughs> Good, yeah, the Godfather versus Batman. Movies are cool. Now you got film score writers that do great, amazing music, but when I tried to do film scoring, and I didn't do much, but I found that it brought the be the worst out in me. It was amazing how that happened because it, it's it's a whole other skill set, you know, to know what to write to a certain scene. That's a whole different right talent you know what I about think. songs has winger songs been in sh i would imagine you've had some of your songs in movies and tv Nothing. by now come on none i think one or two at the most and they were way back in the day uh, bill and ted's excellent adventure we had a song called battle stations and oh. i think uh in karate kid we had a song called out for the count nice and that's the extent of it man piercy though that rat has got it is a huge movies like it's really just like wow i would i would be happy with just one 
film. I mean, the movie The Wrestler has some remakes of rat songs that I did, but I didn't get a dime for that or anything. I want a song that I wrote to be in a major film so I could at least yeah. live in an apartment the rest of my life. Yeah, uh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, you, I, you know, the thing is, is if you just got to show up, I mean, like, you know, you just show up, <laughs> and write the music and get it out there and just don't, for all of you people out there wondering how to get somewhere. Just don't only, give up. Exactly. You just got to show up, do the work every day. Like I say, I mean, if you write every day and you commit to a certain amount of thing, uh, you know, time a week, maybe it's not every day because you have to do something else. But if you commit to a certain amount of time and you just never give up and you just keep pushing, pushing, pushing. I mean, you know, I'm living proof that that'll it, it'll happen. I came from Denver, Colorado, out of the middle of nowhere. And I wanted to do the things I did, and then I mid mid at thirty five, I was like, no, I'm that's I'm I want to do this, you know. And I just did it because I put in the I put in the time, you know. It no, you got the Alice Cooper gig was your first gig, right? Bass for Alice Cooper. That was my first major gig. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty dope. Was that was that a cattle call tryout or? No, no. Bo Hill, the producer who did who right. did Rat. I, I'd known Bo well way before he did Rat. I was 16 when he produced my uh, a, a album for me and, or a, a demo for me and my brothers. And um, uh, he was producing in New York after Rat hit and was getting some big gigs. He did Alice Cooper and they needed a bass player for a few songs. And, and he called me up to do it. And, and I was I just happened to be a humongous Alice Cooper fan. And Kane Roberts is the guy I get to credit for uh, suggesting that I put a bug in Alice's ear that if they go out, you know, that I'd love to go on tour with them. And, and they called me up. And so Kane and I actually auditioned the rest of the band. That's where we found Ken Mary and Paul Taylor and, and uh, Artie, the, the, the other guitar player that was actually was Ken's friend, uh, Kane's friend, but that was a lucky gig. And, you know, I was a huge Alice Cooper fan. Dennis Dunaway, Alice's bass player was a huge influence on me probably the most influential him and Mel Shocker from grand funk and Dale Peterson from the James gang. Those three bass players had more influence on me than anybody. So I knew the music inside and out. And I think, you know, they probably hired me for my voice cause I could sing all the high stuff. But That's uh, like being multilingual, almost like regular society, being able to, do two different tasks like that. I mean, it definitely will get you the job in a lot of cases. Yeah. Singing is hard to come by, you know, it's, uh, yeah. I, by the way, I mean, at this now I'm like terrified to go on stage. I, I still love it. And I love the, the crowd response, but when you're the singer, it's like, well, what's going to happen tonight? It's not like, Oh, I can tune my guitar. Down, down. Right. <laughs> I, well, my voice, <laughs> there. you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, it's always a crapshoot. Well, Kip, uh, we want to thank you, yeah, thank you man. so much with Bottom of Hearts for coming on the show today because I feel like the Chris Aiken Presents show just like went up like five notches on the legitimacy scale oh, of podcasts out there. Yeah, it's bad. Plus, yeah. I think now like our female fan base is pretty much <laughs> quadrupled. It's through the roof. Yeah. That's so terrible. We owe you a big, a big uh, debt of thanks. And the new album is seven. And I... I Told you at the beginning, we're going to play the new song now. That's saving right. the best for last. So. Good idea. Yeah. Pre order, pre order, pre order, pre order. <laughs> and I'll be seeing you on the Monsters of Rock cruise here. I'll bring my speed up. man. I can't wait to see you. Um, there's, there's always some activities that you should sign up for, like painting with rock stars or. I saw that. You know, it's fun. <laughs> it's fun. They were all really good. I saw the paint paintings and I was like, oh, I'm not. I'm going to suck. I just got to get on one of these cruises, man. I'm telling you, I got to get on one of these things. <laughs> well, anyway, my friend, it was a pleasure to see you Thank again. You, and we hope you come back soon. Anytime you got anything to promote, please don't hesitate to uh, come on the Chris Aiken Presents. I appreciate it, you guys. You guys have a good one. Thank you. You too, brother. All Thank right. You, man. Take care, Kip. Yeah. All right. We'll be right back. Hang on. Hey!